Nehemiah chapter 2. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, it's not the car, Nisan, Nisan, which would be about April, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, So we can date this. We can find out the date when our Xerxes, the 20th year of his reign, that wine was before him. And I took up the cup, and I took up the wine, and gave it to the king. Well, when we read chapter 1, verse 11, we're left off where I was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah had the most important job ever in the royalty uh, position. Anywhere and any any time anybody could try to kill the king, and one of the ways would be to poison his food. There was, I think, it was Socrates, somebody like that. They were poisoned by Hemlock. Oh, yeah, Hemlock. Hemlock. Nehemiah, if you know scriptures would take fresh grapes this would be the wine, new wine, this ain't cup <laughs> juice and he would press them in the cup right there in front of the king and there's only one way you would poison the king is if you poison the grapes and probably maybe there'd be a little cup there for Nehemiah to take a drink and watch him and see and then make it sure that it's safe for the king the king would put his life in the cupbearer here, Nehemiah. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. When the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? The king takes a look at him. He's here. He's at some kind of banquet, some kind of dinner. Here comes his servant, and he's got a sad face. And his face shows that he's not happy. king takes a look at him and says, well, what are you doing? What, what's your problem? You're not sick. Why are you sad? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. The king says to him. Now, isn't that kind of rude for a king? For anybody? Oh, you're sad in my presence. And, well, it's not because you're sick. It looks like you're, you know, maybe something's going on in your life. But how dare you be sad in my presence? Then I was very sore afraid. Why would he be afraid? Except for the fact is that maybe one of the things that is going on here is that he could lose his life to the king. All the king had to do was say, that's it. Take his head off his shoulders and to be done about it. Or maybe he's worried and concerned because his position, and I don't mean his position being a cupbearer, as his position before Christ. Well, not Christ, but God as a Jew. As to we today as Christians, our attitude before the people that are around us. Listen, you walk around as a Christian as a sad, mumpy, lumpy little face all day long. How are they supposed to come to Christ? You act like the same way they act like when they got troubles and problems. They just don't have Christ in their life. And you walk around with the mumpy blues and all that other stuff. Where the Bible says, Paul writes, rejoice evermore. Again, I say rejoice. Ezekiel's wife dies and God says, don't you lament. And then when he doesn't lament, the people look at him like, what on earth is your problem? And I've got to say, Christian, what is your problem when you're sad and conscious? I don't care what you're going through. You've got Christ. Christ is the answer. 
one and read the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace. You say, well, Christians suffer. Yeah, Christians suffer, but we all not act like the world and we all not be doing it before others. It's a testimony of what our face looks like. Ezra said God's a mighty, full, powerful God. And the king turned to him and said, you want soldiers and armies? No. I just told you he's a wonderful, mighty, full God. He said, I was, I'd be ashamed to ask after that. Wherefore the king said unto me, why is it? Okay, verse number three. And said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? He's honest. Knows how he doesn't stall for an answer. That. Looks at the king and says, listen, I shouldn't be like this, but my city, my, my hometown is destroyed. That's why I'm sad. You know, a lot of times when, you know, you go up to somebody and say, how you doing? I'm doing fine. And you're lying. And then there are some people you, you don't want to say, how you doing? Because they'll give you the whole entire story. Nehemiah told the truth. He told it quick and got it over with. He didn't describe every gate is destroyed and Every rock, you know. Nehemiah is under Babylon's laws and he must obey them. He's standing before the king. And remember his prayer from chapter 1. He's standing before a Babylon king because of the sin of the nation. He should be standing under a Jewish king doing right praising God then the king said unto me guess who's writing the book for what does thou make request the king looks at him and says okay so what do you want And look at Nehemiah's response. So I prayed to God of heaven. God, the king just, just gave me a blank check. How do you want me to spend it? How about that? That's what you call a Nehemiah prayer. That's a Nehemiah prayer. What do you want? Lord God, help me with this. And I said unto the king, so he didn't say that to the king. So I prayed to the God of heaven. He, he, he had a silent prayer. Very short. If it please the king, if thy servants have found favor in thy sight. Now you know this is the Holy Spirit speaking. That thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto a city of my father's sepulchres that I may build it. He is asking permission. He can't just leave. As I said, he's under Babylon's law. He has an obligation to the king. He is the king's cupbearer. He can't just leave that position. He will defy the God of the Bible, the God of his fathers Abraham Isaac and Jacob if he did not obey the powers that be Romans 13 you say Romans 13 hasn't been written check the law they're supposed to obey the king obeying the king will get his request and get what he needs to be done You will never, ever 
ever, ever, slight chance there of a 1% chance ever had President Obama ask any born-again Christian, what would you like? You say, why not? Because 99.99% .99 the 99 preachers out there have bad-mouthed him, have defied his government, have defiled his rules and regulations, and everything like that, where he wouldn't ask a Christian what would he want. President Obama or any president would never do that. You give one U.S. president to, to, to ask me what anything I would grant. I grant him two things. I ask him two things, Lord willing, in prayer. Number one, I get to talk to you about Jesus Christ. And number two, let me go to New York City and stand before the United Nuts and let me give an hour presentation in the Bible. With all the interpreters. And everybody present. That'd be a great. Uh, I mean, if you, but that ain't gonna happen on the President Obama because everybody's bad mouth him. He knows it because he glasses tells you the bird of the air shall go tell the king. Do you think that guy's ever going to get saved, knowing what the born again Baptist preachers and people are saying about him? I think he's got one word for us. I think it starts with an H. Hypocrisy. Hypocrites. And don't you know that devil is whispering into his ears, love thy neighbor. I mean, yeah, love thy enemy. And what about those born again Christians? You know, the, the scriptures say they're going to love their enemy. They don't love you. I'm just speaking the truth. But what I'm telling you right now is what I'm trying to say is Nehemiah has a great. Listen, he's under a king that serves gods. He's under a king that they're drinking and having feasts. And they're under kings, uh, uh, the same king you go to the book of Esther. He, they have these great little parties and all that. And call my wife out here and do a little belly dancing for everybody. And Nehemiah is subject to all this stuff. He had to be there. He's the, he's the king bearer. He's the wine cup holder. And yet, why did God give him this job? Why is there a Jew in a Gentile court in such a high position it is a, a person of captivity? Because God knows, foreknows, knows that he will need somebody before the king and queen to go back to Jerusalem to build. That thou wouldest send me into Judah and to the city of my father's sepulchres that I may build them. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, out of the mouth of two or three, it shall be established. Look at that. You could take King Azaharis and Nehemiah. You wonder who the queen is? You want to take one guess who the queen is? I'll give you a possible guess. You ready? How about Esther? Check it. Esther with the, the king in Nehemiah. Acts, uh, my boy, I got to look at his name to say it. Our Xerxes. Wouldn't it be great? There is Esther, the Jewish queen, sitting there, smiling at Nehemiah like, yeah. For now, long journey shall. For how long shall the journey be? He asked. Look at that. He hasn't told them no. And when will they return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I sent him a time. Well, the journey we were told in uh, Ezra chapter 7, verse 9, it's a four-month trip. 
and it's at such and such time I'll return back here with word. So he's he's being sent by the king to Jerusalem, but he's also he's got to come back. He's got to report to the king too. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, Euphrates, that they may con convey me over till I come to Judah. This is a travel voucher he gets from the king. He is seeking the king's men, not for protection, and you know he, he's heard the story of Ezra and all the enemies over there, what they've done to try to stop the temple. He's like, if you send me some of your men, they're not going to fight me this time like they did Ezra. They're not going to go back and forth and say, you can't do this. We're going to go right to king and tell the king, blah, 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 blah. If I have some of your men, that says the job is approved by you. See, Nehemiah is using wisdom. In a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give him timbers to make beams for the gates of the palace which pertaineth to the house, and for the wall of the city, for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Now supplies are being requested, and the king says, Okay, here is FEMA in the Bible. The area has been totally destroyed. There has been war and there has been all kinds of destruction. And Nehemiah goes up to the king of Babylon and says, I need some FEMA help. King says, yep. Here's the royal credit card going to the guy into the forest. Cut what beans, what you want, any type of timber you want, and it'll be sent down to you for you to do what needs to be done. How's that? Don't you think it may be quite possible that Gentiles are going to help the Jews to build that city under the Antichrist as the one world government? And Christ says, yeah, go ahead and build all that you need to build. And as we read Proverbs today, the traps, the snares and all that, he's going to use it for a trap to gather Israel. Because he knows there's one place only he can trap all Israel. He knows one place where they have to go. Listen, Pearl Harbor was a trap. Even if they knew the Japanese were coming, you could not get all that ships out of that harbor in time or defend it in time. Norfolk, Virginia is a trap. We don't have multiple sub bases anymore on the East Coast. The one in Maine is gone. The one in Groton, Connecticut is gone. They're all based out of Norfolk, Virginia. And if you look at a map of Norfolk, Virginia, there's no way you get them all out even if you knew attack was coming. Your Navy would be destroyed. Man has not learned from history. Then I came to the governors beyond the river. And gave them the king's letters, which would be sealed with his ring. Now the king has sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. You say, well, why did Ezra did not request the men? And Nehemiah did. Nehemiah didn't tell him about the power of God. Ezra did. Or there may be more opposition right now because that temple's already built. Now here's a group of people who want to go over and build the city. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Amorite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly 
that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. It is the enemies of God. Now they're really upset. You got that temple built. Now you're going to build those walls? But they don't know that. It's not about the walls. We're going to learn that Nehemiah hasn't told them yet. What their concern here is, you care about these stupid little Jews. Who cares about them? What are you coming here to world worried about with the king's letter? That timber that you read about was to build his house, Nehemiah's house. They're thinking, oh boy, Nehemiah's going to build a house, then another one's going to build a house, and then they're going to build a house, and he's going to build a house. And guess what? You're going to have the whole thing back in order again. They're worried. So I came to Jerusalem, and it was there three days. There's that three days again. That's an interesting little study, three days. I rose in the night. I don't know why at night. Maybe couldn't sleep. And some men with me. Neither told I any man what God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. He didn't tell anybody. Neither was there any beast with me save the beast that I rolled upon. <coughs> Excuse me. I went out by night by the gate of the valley. Even before the dragon well. And to the dung port. And viewed the walls of Jerusalem. Which were broken down. And the gates thereof were consumed with fire. So all the gates were wood and they burned them. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool. He's surveying the work that needs to be done. But there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. He couldn't go any further. Then when I up in the night by the brook <clears throat> and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. And the rulers knew not whether I went or what I did. Neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. Notice it says they that did the work. He writes this after everything's done. He's not keeping a journal. The work was done. But he's telling you as of this point, nobody knew. Not even the workers. Then said I unto them. Ye see the distress that we are in. The place is broken down. It's tore up. It's burnt down. It's, there's no houses. There, there's no wall. Just the temple. There's no activity in the city like there used to be. Queen of Sheba is not coming. All the people are not coming trading gold and spices anymore. It's stopped. There's probably wild animals running around. I mean, they had lions back then. There's probably more lions. There's probably more dangers. How Jerusalem laid waste, and the gates thereof are burnt with fire, or burned it with fire. And look at what Jerusalem is today. Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, 
that we be no more a reproach. A reproach of what? What did God say to him when prophesied? When you guys are to walk by this city, you'll say, shh, shh, shh. Hey, why did God do that to him? Because of sins that they did. Where is that mighty temple they built? Where is the mighty city of the great God of heaven? Because of the sin. Come on, Jerusalem. Let's build up. Let's get going. Let's, let's bring back the good news that our God is God. And let's put our sins under. And get serving God. Do you want another revival? I'll tell you what you want if you want a revival in the church. Burn it all down to the ground and rebuild. And don't make it look like the one that was previous. Because people will look at that. Oh, yeah, I remember that building. I, I remember that place. I remember what happened there. I know such and such was there. Yeah, I remember I was a little boy right over there in that thing. We had the vacation Bibles. And I remember all that. You got to get praying to God, chapter 1. And you know what? You got to go back and rebuild everything because everything's been torn down. And hey, listen, if you're a sinner, everything's been torn down. You let sin decay your body. Think about cancer. Man, I really don't not pleased with the message that he preached, and I keep using it. Satan uses a wedge. A wedge is a triangular device. All he's got to do is just stick that point into your life and just slowly hit it with a hammer. And as that thing gets in your, li in your life, the it starts off with a little hole, gets a bigger hole, gets a bigger hole. And when you do that against a tree or a log, and you hit it enough times, you split that log finally in half. And I don't care if you use super glue. There is no way you can physically join that, that log back together again. That's what sin does. You got to burn down and restart. And when it involves people and family and a church, it's kind of hard even still, even if you really do it, because it's still in the back of your mind. There are Jews here right now in the city that remember the junk that was going on. And there were places in the Bible that says that every city had an idol. Can you imagine walking in this land and saying, Oh, I remember that was that pretty little fountain right there with nice little water. That's what they have today. And you go in there and you flip your little coin in there and you make a wish. That's a God. America's full with them. You go over and take pictures, you buy, you spend your money on all kinds of junk and souvenirs and junk like that. There's memories. Even though it's destroyed. I remember the child, there was a bunch of those those little guys in you know robes, they would walk right up to that hill up there and oh wee wah wah wee wah wah you know, whatever. I still got Roman Catholicism right here, stuff I remember. Burn it down, restart, but it's still there. But you got to put it under the blood. Unlike ne Nehemiah, but they can put it under the blood. But we have the sinless, perfect blood of Jesus Christ and to build on. Scrape off the dust and build.
that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which is good, which was good upon me. You say, what's going on there? You're not going to believe this. I was sitting there. I had the cup in the king's hand. You know, I was sad. I I looked sad too. King looked at me. He says, "Why are you sad?" Uh, King, I'm I'm so I'm sorry. I'm sad, but uh, you know, my family and the house and all that is ruined. And well, what do you want to do about it? King, you feeling okay? God, he gave me a blank check. Well, ask him to go back. King, can I go back and and check out my, my homestead? And Yeah, sure. What do you need? I need you to pinch me because I don't think I'm awake right now. Uh, build some stuff like that. Can I have some men and, and, and travel orders? And all? Yeah, sure. Here it is. Walking out of the palace that day. Wow. What was that? I went to work this morning crying and in and, 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 and tears and pain of my city and the people's going on. And I come home from work. I punch out after eight hours. And I'm, honey, I'm going to Jerusalem. Yeah, right. Like we got the money. I'm being paid by my job to go to Jerusalem. That's what he told the people. You don't believe us. God sent Artaxerxes to... I'm here because of the king. I'm here because of God. And also the king's words that he had spoken on me. Like I just said, he told the whole story. Now isn't that great? Because we read King Cyrus told Ezra to go back and build a temple. Now you have King Artaxerxes telling Nehemiah, go back and do what you have to do. Out of the mouth of two or three... It shall be established. Remember, we looked at King Cyrus, King Darius, and King Artaxerxes. Three kings, three royal decrees to go and do what you're doing. How about that? And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. But when Sanballat and Horonite and Tobiah, the servant of the Ammonite. Ammonite? Isn't that the guy, isn't that the family of Lot and his daughter? And Gisham, the Arabian? Oh, look at, look at the enemies come up now, the Arabians. They're part of Ishmael. Oh, Abram had one little sin problem in his life. And 400 years later, if not more, more than 400 years, B.C. 440, and let me check here real quick, using Unser's chronology, it's pretty good, I assume, a lot better than my dates. And we got 2126 BC in chapter 12 of Genesis. So 700 years above, you know, give or take. I'm not, it's not being, we're not being exact here. Here's Ishmael showing back up. You know, there are certain sins that you can pass on to your children that they won't get rid of them. One of them sins is STDs. You can pass that on and keep it passing on. You mess with the wrong woman or wrong guy. This date, never mind. 
But when Sanballat the whole, the whole night, and Tobiah the servant and Am, the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will you rebel, rebel against the king? Now look at that lie. He just went over and said, Look at the king's papers. I have a free ticket here. I have a I have a free check here. I have been given authorization. What do you mean rebel against the king? How could it be rebelling against the king when I got his letters here? See, they'll use anything to get you to quit, even that that which is a lie. Get used to that. They will lie to you. When we're talking about Jake's wife a couple weeks ago, when they were talking about the, the thing downtown, oh, you can't do that here. Well, why not? It's our property. Well, you know, you know, well, if I were to get injured, who, I mean, would I go after you guys for the laws? Oh, no, 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 no. That's the city. <laughs> they lied to them. Thinking that, oh, you'll stop because of a lie. And when if you're going to have any kind of public or any kind of ministry with Jesus Christ, just because they come up to you or they call you on the phone, I'm going to call the cops. Listen, just say to them, you want the phone number? I even had one time when I had somebody call me up and try to start a church. I'm going to call the cops, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, here's the phone number. I called the cops an hour later. I said, listen, I, I, I just got to know something. I, I, I shouldn't be doing this, but... Did you receive a phone call about me about an hour ago? And that no. He goes, why? I says, well, it's a long story. I just wanted to know. A lot of times they ain't gonna do it. It's just lies. And when somebody comes up to you, well, you know, if you give me some money, I'll give you money back. No, they're not going to. Very rarely, well, you may get one percent that will. They're trying to stop you. And they think just because if they tell a filthy, nasty lie, it's going to work. It will do you wrong, let me get this, if you obey the lie that they tell you. Then answered I them, and said unto them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Isn't that something that uh, Spock used to say on Star Trek? Live long and prosper. Or something? Get out of the Bible. Why don't they quote Shakespeare? Why don't they attack Shakespeare and his weird kind of English that he has? Why do they always got to go to the Bible? Because it's God's Word. I think we should come up with an ASV of uh, well, I forgot his name. What was his name? Shakespeare. The American Standard Version of Shakespeare in American English language to make it so we can understand. Julie, old oh Julie, why are you here? Romeo, Romeo, because I love you. And then stop him. Being a little pansy kind of pants jumping around, whatever kind of junk like that. I don't know. All right, get back. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. Now, watch this. Nehemiah knows exactly what Ezra went through. And if you go back to Ezra, we're not going to go back there for a state of time. But you'll find one time that the enemy came up to Ezra and said, We want to build with you because God brought us out to be here and blah, 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 blah. It was a lie. And Ezra said, No. You're not going to take part in our work. So Nehemiah, knowing history, steps in and says, you have no portion, no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. Don't you dare come back and do what you try to do to Ezra. I beat you off at the pass. 
By the way, don't go say, I'm going to go, go back to Ezra and read. I'm going to write a letter to the king. Blah, 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 blah. I have the letter from the king. Don't go start your, all your trouble you're going to do because I got the men of the king over there. I know what you did to my friend Ezra. I prepared myself. See, Nehemiah used Ezra, and Ezra wasn't wrong. Ezra had no idea what was happening when it happened. But Nehemiah learned from Ezra the stories that were told about the enemy, and the Bible says we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. And you ought not to be ignorant also of the things that he will do to try to bring us down. Nehemiah knew exactly what Satan would do to try to disrupt the work, and he went in there first. Now, it's not to say that Satan won't use other means, but Satan couldn't use these guys again here. They're going to come back. Listen, Satan uses three things in our life and three things only. The lust of the eyes. Everything your eyeballs see. The pride of life. Who I am and what I am. And the lust of the flesh. You check everything out and what you're going to do with those three things to check to see if it's right. Will it glorify God or will it glorify the flesh? That, that's what you check music with. There's one question you need to ask yourself. If you are really a born-again, Bible-believing Christian, you really believe Jesus Christ is coming again. You believe he's coming any minute. You will ask yourself, this will be one thing you can ask yourself. Would God be pleased... To catch me doing this, if he were to call me out right now. Would, I, would God really be pleased to be caught up to heaven with a Budweiser in my hand? Would God be really pleased to blow smoke in his face after he caught me up? Would God be pleased to be in bed with a woman, oh, excuse me, the wrong woman, Would God be pleased if he, if I'm putting money to something that I ought not be putting money to? Would God be pleased to find me somewhere where I'm not to be, where I should be somewhere else at that moment? If you really believe the, the rapture, you would think about those things before you sin. At a moment at the twinkle of an eye, right? Well, see, we don't really have the fear of God. Or we would, we would, <laughs> uh, the Lord's going to come. Uh. Nehemiah, he learned from past experience, and he said, listen, I'm going to defeat sin. I'm going to defeat the devil right now. You're not even allowed here. That's what he says. You're not even allowed here. You got to say, you're not even allowed here. I'm going to build, and guess what? I ain't going to have you in here. Get out. By the way, when you do that to Satan, he'll get mad. When you say like Nehemiah, I'm going to stand up for God, you get out of here. Oh, you better believe the devil will now put on his armor. He will set the alarm clock so the devil's in hell, and he, he'll go after you. That's why Christians don't want to live right. The harder you stand for the Lord, the harder the devil will try to kick you. That's a close for there.